just say good morning and what a joy it is to be in the house of the Lord and how we wish that it were made possible so all of you could be here with us. To our church family, we want to assure you we love you, thank God for you, and thank God for your faithfulness of serving and walking before our Lord Jesus Christ. This is indeed a special day, Easter, time that we lift our voice and sing and give praise to him over the fact that he lived. He arose victorious, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I. And we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that we can feel, and it leads us and guides us from day to day. And I know you, there are many decisions being made. Some is difficult, and some may be going through hardship. And many across the country, there is pain, of agony, and suffering because of those who are sick and those who have passed away. And we ask men and women everywhere to pray, call upon God. And moms and dads, pray with your family. Pray with your children. Point them to the Lord. Let us not be a complainer or a doubter are a problem to the, to the country. Let us join in and find our place before Almighty God and look into Him. We love you and we thank God for you. We're going to pray and we thank God for the singers who are here with us this morning. They're going to be a blessing to your heart and any of the songs they sing, you are welcome to join in and sing with us. It makes it feel like we've been the church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of gathering here this morning. Though we're just a few, but we thank God for each one that finds their way here to help us put this program on. And may it be more than a program. May it be church service. May they be able to sense and feel the presence of God wherever they are at, at this time. And Father, we call upon you and ask that you may give the so uh, wisdom of Solomon to those who are leading the country, those who are making decisions today. It's not an easy time. It's a difficult time. It's a time of trials, and it's a time, Lord, of painful. And there are some of them, Lord, going through such a difficult time trying to figure out. And we thank you for all and ask your blessings upon them. And then our church family, Lord, would you be near to them? Would you bless them? Now, Father, we have some that are homebound sick. How we pray for them this morning. Would you be near to them and bless them as only you can? And again, now. Help us, and may all that we say or do be pointing to you and giving you the honor and the glory. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said amen. Amen. Join us as the singers come this morning and sing down at the cross. Jesus so sweetly abides within 
how many of you can lift your hands and say, I have been to the cross. I have met the Savior. Today is a special day for me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's all sing together. We're going to sing our favorite Easter hymn, Because He Lives, I Can Face Tomorrow. And then after that, we'll take a moment and have Kids Corner. So at this time, gather the children around. We want to have a special message just for them. Let's sing. Isn't that the truth? I can gladly say that it is because he lives. At this time, we'll have Kids Corner. So if I could have all the little ones come right on down by the phone or the tablet or the TV, and I want to just share a special Easter message with you. One that I heard many years ago, and I love it. It's a story I've never forgotten. And I want to share it with you today. It's a story of an old preacher. He was on his way walking to the church one day when he saw a young boy walking down the street. And he had something unusual in his hand. He had a birdcage, an old rusty birdcage, all dirty. And in the birdcage, he had about three or four little sparrow birds, just brown birds. And the preacher saw the boy and thought it was peculiar. And he said, young man, what do you have there? He said, well, I... I've got these birds. He said, well, what are you going to do with them? The boy said, well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play with them, and, and I'm going to uh, make them uh, do some tricks, and, uh, and then I don't know. Well, the preacher said, surely 
you'll get tired of that after a while. And then what will you do with those birds? He said, well, I don't know. I, I got some cats. And I think maybe I'll just feed them to my cats. My cats like to eat birds. And the preacher said, oh, oh, okay, well, that's good. Uh, you wouldn't by chance sell me those birds, would you, son? And the boy was kind of shocked. He said, what do you want these old birds for? They're just old brown birds. and They, they can't even sing. He said, I just, I just kind of like those birds. I'd like to have them. He said, no, I'm just going to play with them. He goes, I, I'll give you a dollar. The boy said, no, I, I couldn't. He goes, I'll give you two dollars. And the boy was surprised. That was a lot of money for a little boy. And he agreed. He said, okay. Well, the preacher pulled out two dollars and gave to the boy. And the boy took the two dollars and he handed over the old rusty bird cage with a couple of brown birds inside. The preacher watched the boy run off to the store to spend his money. And the preacher went over by the church and turned the corner. And he knelt down and opened up that bird cage. And he began to tap on the back of it until all of those birds had found the little door and had escaped to freedom. And that reminds me of another little story that happened one day. One day the devil had a cage full of people in this old world. And they were just ordinary people, couldn't do much and weren't worth much. And the Lord Jesus asked the devil and said, what do you got there? And he said, well, I got this old world full of people and... He said, well, what are you going to do with them? He said, well, I'm just going to play with them, and I'm going to probably poke them, and I'll, I'll make them do some tricks, and I'll make them fight, and I'll make them get angry, and I'll make them argue, and I'll, I'll make them divorce and kill each other, and, you know, they'll throw bombs at one another, and they'll fight each other. And the Lord said, but then what are you going to do with them? He said, well, I don't know. They're not really good for much. You see how they behave, and I guess I'll just kill them. And the Lord said, I see. The Lord Jesus looked at him and said, would you let me buy them from you? He said, what do you want with this whole world full of people? They'll just, they'll just mock you and they'll just laugh at you. And, and one day they'll just beat you senseless and put, put nails through your hands and, and stick you up on a cross and just ridicule you. And they'll disappoint you. I mean, from here on out. And the Lord said, I, I'd still like to have them. He said, would you take him? The devil said, no, I wouldn't sell him. I just, I'd like to use him for my own amusement. He said, name your price. The devil said, well, I guess it'll take all your sweat and all your pain and all your blood. And then you can have him. The Lord Jesus gladly looked at him and said, sold. And so the Lord paid a price for us. And he poured out all of his blood, and he endured all the pain so that he could have this world full of people, so that on Easter he could open up the door and tap on the back of it and encourage little boys and girls like me and you to come on out and be free. That's what Easter is all about. Can you hear him tapping on the cage today? Wouldn't it be marvelous if somebody who today wasn't free because of sin or addiction Today they could see that what Jesus did on Easter was for them. And just come on out. Receive the free gift that the Jesus, our Lord and Savior, the Christ, the, the sovereign Lord of everything offers to you and me. That's what he does. And that's what Easter is all about. The door of the tomb was opened. Not so that he could come out. But it's so that me and you could have freedom when we look in. Let me pray with you kids, and then we're going to sing some more. And I love to hear you sing, so I want to hear you sing from home, okay? I'm going to ask mom and dad. I want to make sure that you're singing and worshiping. Lord Jesus, would you bless our children who are at home today? Wherever they are watching this, Lord, would you encourage their hearts? Would you bless them? Would you help them? Would you speak to their little hearts about the true meaning of Easter? How it's the greatest day that ever was. And you did it, Lord, all for us. I thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. And I want to say my prayers in the name of Jesus. And what do we all say? Amen. Amen. Well, I love you guys, and I can't wait to see you again. But until then, we're just going to continue to worship and praise the Lord. Would you sing with us? We're going to sing the marvelous old song, He Lives, He Lives.
Miss Linda and Miss Margie to come sing My Jesus, I Love Thee. That was wonderful and how true. Church, the real story of Easter is simply this. It's that Jesus Christ came to stand in our place. The God the Father poured out his wrath on his son. And Isaiah 53 says he was glad to do it. 
In a nutshell, it's simply this, that Jesus was treated on Easter like you and I deserve to be treated because we are sinful, because we are unworthy, so that the Father could treat us the way that Jesus deserves to be treated. And when he sees us, he sees the blood of his spotless lamb. He sees the holiness of heaven. The Bible says that if you're born again, you are the righteousness of God. What a gift that we couldn't earn, we couldn't beg, borrow, steal, we couldn't buy, we couldn't barter for it. It simply has been given to us. I know that you feel unworthy. Oh, my friends, but just be glad and gladly receive the truth that when he sees me, when he sees you, he sees the blood of the Lamb. Looking down through the ages, God be here to die and see. And it lost separation Never more could man be I know at home that you can rejoice and I want you to know that here in this room tears fill our eyes the spirit of the Lord is in this place always so worthy there's a story
How can you refuse him now? How can you turn away from his side? With tears in his eyes on the cross when he died, how can you refuse Jesus? Pastor's going to come and pray over the sermon today. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderful songs that have been sung, which reminds us of your love and of your mercy and your goodness. And as John comes to share with us from the Word, we thank you for the Word of God. By the word of God, we found our way, finding our way to the city of God. And through the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And Father out there, they may be that man, that woman, that boy, girl, who have never trusted you for salvation. May as the word goes forth today, may it break down that wall of resistance, that wall of proud and arrogant. May they see their need of a Savior, and may they call upon you. May we hear the good news this week that someone come to know Christ as Lord and Savior. We thank you again for the Word, because through the Word, I'm able to say, I know that I'm a child of God. Job said, I know that he lives. And Paul said, I know whom I have believed in, persuaded to that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So bless him as he stands today, and may the word of God find a lodging place in our hearts. All of this in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Brother John. <clears throat> amen. Amen. Can I just start by saying, He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for celebrating. It's very important, church, the things that we decide to celebrate. And is there anything greater to celebrate other than our risen Lord who stands right now in heaven making intercession for you and for me? <laughs> if there's anything worth celebrating, it's that, that Easter is real and that Christ is risen. In fact, I was just in the two likely locations of the burial of Christ. I was in both of them back in June. And I can tell you this about both of them. They are both empty. He is not there. He is not there. And um, it's a miraculous thing that many have tried to explain away, but the evidence is so strong for the resurrection. And all of our hopes and all of our faith hangs on the truth of the resurrection. 
And I want to invite you in your Bible today to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, and I want to read to you the story of what happened on that most awesome morning. What had happened there on the cross was brutal. It was unspeakable. In fact, I think it's publicly recorded that never did anyone ever survive a Roman crucifixion. Some folks say that Jesus swooned and that he wasn't really dead. If that's the case, he would be the only person to have ever done that. No one ever survived. These were the greatest killers in the whole world. They were absolute professionals at what they did. And so what happened on the cross was as intense as you can imagine, and then some. Friends, I want to turn your attention to Matthew 28. Christ had been beaten. Christ had been bruised. He had been whipped. He had been nailed to a cross, and the Bible tells us that he did not even object, nor did he protest, but that he gladly gave himself into the hands of his offenders and laid himself willingly upon the cross. What was it like for his back that had been rent so terribly by the cat of nine tails? To be laid on a, on a bare, hard, rough-sawn piece of timber. It must have been something to see the reaction of the soldiers. Had they ever had a man crawl toward his own cross? Had they ever had a man put out his hand willingly to be crucified? Had they ever had one that did not scream and cry and kick and fight? He must have been so unique in the way that he submitted himself to them. It had to be unreal. And there on the cross, darkness fell on the face of the earth. It was an absolute miraculous thing that had happened and has never happened again. It was not a solar eclipse. The sun stopped shining for three hours. At the end of that three hours, as they are stumbling around in the dark, they're at the foot of the cross, if you can imagine, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of our Lord, John the disciple. There they are looking up, straining through the darkness to see him. They can hear him breathing. They hear him whisper faintly the seven sayings from the cross, which John would later write down in his gospel. They can hear him saying things like, forgive them, Father, they don't know what they're doing. He can hear him saying things like, I thirst. They could hear him say things like, Pestelestai, it is finished. There, at the sixth hour, darkness filled the land. Fear filled the hearts of men and women. Well, they weren't done being afraid because there came a great mighty earthquake. The earth shook at the moment of our Lord's death when he gave up the ghost and cried, it is finished. The earth shook in such a way and such tremendous damage was done to the holy site. There in Jerusalem, upon in the temple, where the whole temple was torn and so much so that right down the middle, the veil was rent right in half, a six and a half inch thick garment that separated the holy of holies from the rest of the tabernacle was torn right in two like a hot knife through butter. And he was dead. Just to make sure, they came along and they put a spear through the right side under the ribcage, piercing his heart, and out flowed a tremendous amount of blood and water. It was at that moment, one of the soldiers, he looked around and said, what have we done? Surely this was the Son of God. Gladly they took his body down, and it was a relief to everyone involved that it was over. It took his body off the cross and pulled the nails from his wrists and from his feet. Joseph of Arimathea, one of the Sanhedrin court members, begged Pilate if he could have his body to bury it in his tomb. Pilate had taken a bit of a liking to Jesus, and he granted it to be so. And so Jesus' body was taken and washed, and it was anointed with spices and herbs, and in a hurry it was put in the tomb because it was falling that evening on the Sabbath. And they put his body in the tomb, and a stone was rolled there to 
keep guard. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of our Lord, and John the disciple, the Bible says in the Gospel of Luke, they beheld the place where they laid his body. They did not know, but here would come Roman soldiers to guard the tomb, and the soldiers made them leave. Let me tell you what happened. Not Friday night, not Saturday morning, not Saturday afternoon or Saturday night. But early Sunday morning, before the sun even came up, just as it was getting barely daylight enough to see, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of our Lord, they get up early to go and to take more spices, hopefully that they can anoint his body. When they get there, what has happened? Matthew 28 is what had happened. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came down and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Put yourself there. Can you imagine it? What it sounded like, what it felt like. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake. These Roman guards, they did shake and became as dead men. I don't know what that means, but I believe several of them passed out. Either that or they became so afraid they became catatonic where they could not speak or move. We know at this point they scrambled and ran for their lives. And for fear of them, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. Verse 5, and the angel answered and said unto the women, fear not ye. For I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, like he told you he would, come, see the place where he lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen, for he is dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. My friends, the most glorious Easter message was delivered first by an angel. And I want to just tell you for a moment three things about this angel that I think will bless you and help you. The first thing I want you to notice is the angel's mission that he was on. The angel was on a mission from the Lord. Can you imagine how great it was for that angel to receive that mission from the Father? Come here, Gabriel. Come here, come here. I want you to go down there. I want you to make an entrance. You know, like you do, made of lightning and whatnot. Just like there was an earthquake when he died, I want there to be an earthquake when he arises. And I want you to roll back that stone so that he can come out. No, no, he's already gone. He don't need you to roll away the stone so he can come out. I want you to roll away the stone so that they can look in. What a marvelous mission it was. Can you imagine how excited that King Angels was to shoot down from heaven like a lightning bolt, looking like a lightning bolt, and slam into the ground and wake up those soldiers from their slumber or from their shooting dice or whatever they were doing, scare the daylights out of them, all covered in lightning and whatnot, rolls away the stone. By that time, the Lord was already good and gone. Think about that. The Lord came out of the tomb like just right through the wall. He came walking out of there. He didn't need anyone to open the door for him. He's already gone by the time the angel gets there. What a marvelous mission to look and see the evidence that the tomb is empty. Now, I told you, and me and Hannah were there. The tomb is empty. We saw it for ourselves. All of the historical data says that the tomb was empty, not because of theft of the body of Christ, but because he rose from the grave. In fact, I can tell you that there is no historical data anywhere in the world, documented anywhere, even in the first century, the first hundred years, that says that he did not rise from the grave. Oh, but there's document after document and account after account within months of his raising. Folks wrote it down and said, I saw him. I beheld him. I saw the hands that were nail printed. I saw his side with a big hole. I saw him. I saw him. I can't, I just, I don't know what to say, but I saw him. The evidence is there of the first hand witnesses that beheld him. The evidence is all there. Just as the uh, angel says, look, see for yourself. I have been sent all this way to show you nothing, that he is no longer there. 
But sure, the evidence is there. I, I want to just tell you, my friends, I am so glad to bring you the evidence today and ask you to look for yourself. He is risen. He is not there. If you'll try to find his body or a casket with his name on it, it will not exist. Our Lord came out of the grave victorious. Why is that important? Well, if he'd have just died, he'd have been like every other goat or lamb that was ever slain. He had to rise from the grave victorious over death and hell and the grave for it to mean anything to you. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ did not die, we are of all men most miserable. If he did not rise from the grave, our faith is in vain. My friends, all of the evidence is there. Just consider for a second that no one ever survived a Roman crucifixion. So surely he did die. And they guarded the tomb. But then on the third day he was gone. And you want to tell me that a couple of fishermen came and stole the body of our Lord from an entire Roman guard? <laughs> they even said, we were sleeping and they came. In the Roman guard, if you fell asleep during your duties, you'd be killed. I assure you, they were not sleeping. They were on guard. They were the best of the best. But if an angel from the Lord comes slamming into the ground like a meteorite, you'd run for your life. That's exactly what happened. And Christ was already gone. There is no guarding our Lord. You can't box him up. You can't keep him in a cave. You can't do anything this morning other than acknowledge his existence and thank him for his sacrifice. The evidence that the early accounts were given, that the empty tomb is there, and there's no plausible reason for it not to be there other than the resurrection. The eyewitnesses that said they saw him. And if you want to read there in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15, I'll read it for you. <clears throat> the Bible says, as I was delivered first to you, in verse 3, that received how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures, that he was seen of Cephas and of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. They all saw him all at one time together of whom the greater part are still alive. They still remain to this present day, and some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then of the apostles. And last, Paul says, he was even seen of me. I saw him. The Lord showed me himself, physically, bodily resurrected. I mean, just think, I mean, this is just one man's account, but I just want you to ask, to ask you, where are the other accounts that said he did not rise? Where are the other pieces of literature? They simply do not exist. In fact, there's more proof that Christ rose from the grave than there is that George Washington was ever the president of this great country. I'm talking about physical paper documentation. There is more, if you're going to put it on a scale, to say that Christ rose from the grave than there is to ever say that George Washington was ever the president of our great country. The evidence is all there. But I would ask for your uh, consideration into one more piece of evidence. The disciples who after the Lord had risen from the grave, they were cowering away in a room, afraid that the Jews would come and kill them too, that the soldiers would seize them and kill them too. Can you imagine giving your life for a liar? Can you imagine giving your life, knowing that you would die for a farce, for a joke? If Christ did not rise and show himself to his disciples, if they weren't completely convinced, would they have all gone to a terrible and a brutal grave? Would John have been boiled in oil and exiled on Patmos and killed that way? Would Peter have been crucified upside down? Would the others have been beheaded or stoned to death? Now, see, they were all convinced that just like the angel said, look for yourself, see that he is not here, that he is risen. The mission that the angel was on is the one that I'm on today. Look for yourself. See and make up your mind. Number two, not only the mission that the angel was on, but the message that the angel delivered. Would you look in Matthew 28 into verse 5? And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. I love the message that he gives to them. The first thing that he says there in all of his boiling raiment, do not be afraid. Fear not. 
My friends, I know many of us across the land today have many reasons to be afraid, and I am not here to tell you that those reasons are not legitimate. This is a scary time in the world, not just here in America, but around the globe. And I will give you this, I will give you this advice. I would give you this command from the Bible. Fear not. Jesus would say it this way: do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't look at what you see and believe it. Look on what you know is happening. God is doing his work, even through fearful times. Do you think that Mary and Mary were afraid? Do you think that James and Peter and John were afraid? Do you think that these were uncertain times? And the Lord in that same day told them, do not let your heart be afraid. What he's saying is, do not let your heart and your emotions get the best of you, but trust in the Lord. Remember what the Lord said. That's what the angel said. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Don't put so much stock in what the news commentator says. Look at what the Bible commentator has said. He is not here. Put your trust in that. Put your trust in the fact that he said, I am going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. This is what Christ said. This is what I'm living on. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. The Easter message is one of hope and peace and confidence. I love the fact that the Lord told his best and brightest angel, and I mean brightest in the, in the most bright sense, go tell them there's no need to live in fear. There's no need to live in panic. There is no need to be overcome with our emotions. But instead, let us look to where Jesus is. What's the advice that he gives them? Look in verse 7. And go quickly. Tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him. I love it. I have told you. That's how he finishes verse 7. What does he say? Look for Jesus. Get up out of your frightful and fearful state. Straighten yourself up. Confidence your heart. Look at what is really happening. That God has overcome the whole world. He said, I'll not leave you. I'll not first. Just because you can't see him does not give you permission to fall into a puddle of tearful fear. But look to where Christ is. Where is Christ? He says that he's going to Galilee. Up in the northern part of Israel. They're around the sea, where Peter's from, where he called his disciples. He goes, we're going to go back to the basics, where we all started from, and I will meet you there. The message of Easter this morning is that not we need some new revelation. We don't need a new message. We don't need a new gospel. We need to go back to the basics, and we need to remember what God has told us about himself. He is faithful. He cannot be unfaithful. He is truthful. He cannot tell a lie. If it's in the scriptures, it has been verified by the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord. These are historical, scientific facts. This is what our hope is to be in. And our hope is to be placed in the word of the Lord, that we are to look for his coming. Not only the mission and the message of the angel, but look at the master of the angel. And let me just ask you in passing, is he your master today? Or is he just a figure that we talk about at Christmas and Easter. Look in verse 8 of our text. They departed quickly from the sepulcher. And look at what it says. With fear and great joy. I want to tell you that fear is natural. <laughs> but if you come to Christ, it will be mingled with joy. And the more time you spend with the Lord, and the more time you spend seeking the Lord and chasing after the Lord, the less fear you will experience and the more joy you will experience. You'll not always be happy following the Lord. If you give your life to Christ today, you will not be happy and, and, and it will not always be rainbows and butterflies and sunshine all the rest of our day, but you will have joy eternal, a peace that passes all understanding. They left out of there with fear, but with greater joy, and they did run and bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, as they went about their mission, as they went about doing what they knew to do, who meets them? Jesus met them, saying, all hail. And they came and beheld him. They held him 
by the feet and they worshiped him. Jesus said to them, be not afraid. Go and tell my brethren. My friends, I want to tell you, I heard some things that were discouraging yesterday from our governor. I'm here to tell you, I am not afraid. I am not worried. (laughs) I, I am concerned about things. My hope and trust is in the Lord. I have confidence and I have peace today. And I have been sent here on Easter today to tell you about Jesus. I do not want you to be afraid. I do not want you to flounder in fear. But I want you to trust the Lord because He is here and He is available. This is what the angel said to them. Look at the end of verse 7. The angel tells them about how he is risen, and behold, he goes before you. He's risen, and he is here for you to find. The end of verse 7 says this, I have told you. Have you ever noticed that little phrase before? The angel says, and when I leave out of here, I'm not coming back to tell you again. Hear it now. Hear it forever. Listen to me now and hear me later. He is to be found. The message has been preached. I have given you the truth today, the truth of what happened on that most glorious day. And you can embrace it, you can reject it. It is up to you. But I hope that you will gladly rejoice. I hope that you'll share this video. I hope that you will share it with maybe an unbelieving person who is thirsty and hungry. Because the lifeline is there. The salvation of the Lord is there. It's to be found. He is to be sought. I'm reminded of a man who was under a hurricane precaution in his state. Since we can talk about state mandates today, the state had said everyone must evacuate. The hurricane is coming. Well, the man hunkered down in his house, and the sheriff came to his house and knocked on the door, and the man has battened down the hatches. He said, Sheriff, I'm going to ride out the storm. I trust in the Lord, and he's going to save me and see me through. The sheriff said, You're crazy. You ought to come with me. Well, the Storm came, the rain fell, the wind blew. The water came up past the man's front porch and it came into his front living room. A boat came by from the Coast Guard, a rescue boat, and said, Sir, get in the boat. The tide is rising. The flood is coming. You will die. The man pulled up his britches and said, I trust in the Lord and he's going to see me through. They said, You're crazy and you're going to die. Well, the floodwaters kept rising and and up into the second level of his house, and the man is up on his rooftop. Well, a helicopter, a military helicopter came by. They shouted with a loudspeaker as they dropped down a rope ladder. Sir, grab the rope. Climb the rope. Help is here to save you. He shouted back. You know what he said. I trust in the Lord. He's going to see me through. Well, the story goes at the Rains continued to fall, the wind continued to blow, and the floods continued to rise. The man drowned in his own self-righteous stupidity. He got to heaven and he asked the Lord, I thought you would save me. I I put my trust in you. I I thought you'd see me through. And the Lord said, I sent you a sheriff. I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. But if you will not receive the help, help cannot be given. My friend, today the message has been given. It must be received. You must grab on. Salvation is here. I'm reminded of, a, of a, a passage of sailors that came from the south of Spain. And they came all the way to South America. They were dying of thirst for they had run out of water. They came into the headwaters of the, the Nile. And on the second or third day before they reached land, over half of the sailors died of thirst. They didn't realize that they had been floating in fresh water for two days. How ironic and how terrible, how unjust would it be to die of thirst, floating in what exactly you need. My friends, as Brother Terry plays, I just want to tell you, right now, this is what you need. Help is here. The resurrection has taken place. The price has been paid. Every sin you've ever committed has been covered in the blood of Christ. But you must reach out and say, yes, Lord, me too. Don't pass me by. Save me, Lord, and he will save you today. If you will but receive the help, if you will but drink the water that we are floating in. My friends, he's good. He's here. He's available. He's enough. 
He's alive. Could I introduce you to him today? Let's sing. Let's sing together. Yes, Lord. I will ever love and trust Him. It is business daily. Can you say it? I surrender. Right there at your computer. Right there in your living room. There in the den where you watch. Just say, Lord, I surrender. That's all it takes. Lord, I give myself to you. I give myself into whatever you would have for me, Lord. I surrender. I'm going to have her sing one more verse. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures are forsaken. How many of you can say, I've had enough of this world. I don't want any more of what it has to offer. I just surrender. I give myself to Jesus. Lord, have your way. I've tried having my way. It doesn't work. I'm not enough. Oh, but my friends, he is. He is more than enough for you today. I surrender. As we play softly, the Bible says this. Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And I will sup with him and he with me. It's just that simple, my friends, to pray a prayer like this. I surrender to you today, Lord. I repent of my sins. Change my heart, Lord and make me yours. I want to live for you. I give myself to you today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. My friends, that's it right there. That's the Easter message. And I want to thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for coming and being part and worshiping, not spectating, but worshiping our worthy Lord today. My church, I want to just thank you so much for your giving and your faithful support. I can't tell you how much it means to us as we continue on the work of the Lord here, how your support has been so encouraging. We love you. Let me ask God's blessing over you before we go. Father, would you bless and would you help? Lord, the hearts that are troubled, would you mend them? Would you help? Lord, we think this morning of Christine Setzer, Lord, and and her health issue, God, would you bless her and have your way and direct and guide the doctors. And Father, for those across the land suffering from this virus, would you bless them. And for those courageously on the front lines helping to defeat this silent, invisible enemy, God, help. Meet our needs. After all, we know that you are the God of all comfort and the God of all peace. We thank you for Easter power of the resurrection. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, amen. God bless you. Happy Easter. We love you.